Welcome back to Compressible Flow. I'm Professor Steve Miller. Today we'll be talking about an introduction to isentropic flow, which represents a new module in our class. We'll talk about what isentropic flow is, and we already alluded to this in the introductory material of the class. Then we'll talk about Reynolds transport theory and derive the basic area relations for isentropic flow. Next, we'll apply this to the so-called convergent-divergent stream tubes and derive the Mach number area equation. Then I'll show some examples which you're welcome to work through yourself to get you started. And I'll just briefly mention their motivation. Let's get started. It's always fun to start with a small quote. This one is of course by Claude Shannon. You should call it entropy for two reasons. In the first place, your uncertainty function has been used in statistical mechanics under that name, so it already has a name. In the second place, and more important, no one really knows what entropy really is, so in a debate you will always have the advantage. This is suggested to Claude Shannon as a name for his new uncertainty function as quoted in Scientific American. Let's return to the famous photo. This is not of a bullet by Ernst Mach, but a similar one at higher speeds and without the use of, of course, wires to close the shutter, which would appear as vertical lines. Remember, this is a Schlieren image and the contours represent density gradient. Here you'll see that the dark colors represent sharp increases in density and the white parts of the image represent expansions or decreases in density of the fluid. That is rho in the equations of motion. Here the camera is stationary and the bullet moves supersonically from right to left. Once again in this class we'll try and study shock waves, the expansion waves, and this is the turbulent wake which we won't get to in this class unfortunately, and all the areas in between. So we're studying the entire flow field except for the turbulent part. Out here, the medium, that is the air or gas in this case, is completely undisturbed by the bullet and accompanying shock waves. The air moves from left to right in the stationary reference frame of the bullet, and it moves through this shock wave where there's a huge entropy increase. And then it goes back and returns to a relatively high speed supersonic flow, and it goes through a system of shocks. Anywhere in this type of flow, where there's not turbulence, or not in the boundary layer, and we're not at a shock wave or in the turbulent wake, and of course not inside that body, we could approximate our flow as isentropic, being that there's very little heat transfer in the flow, if any, and there's very little entropy gain, if any. These engineering approximations allow us to solve and create powerful tools in the field of aerospace engineering. Let's look at a pictorial diagram of this particular bullet. So once again, the bullet body or projectile body is this graded area and it's moving from left to right and or our camera is stationary about the bullet. From the previous picture, we'll try and label some of these flow phenomena so that we can really define it. And we'll get to these later, some of them later. Out here is supersonic flow, as I mentioned, and then there's some very interesting bow shock, and the bow shock is not attached to the front of the uh, flight vehicle in this case. So you see here's that shock, and here's the front of the bullet, and they're not connected at all. Then of course we have the bullet surface, and on that surface is a turbulent boundary layer, and you can see that in the image right here is this large white area and black area in front of the bullet. This is main, some shadow in here from, of course, the image of the stern. It's a system of light and mirrors, of course. Out here we also have isentropic flow, mainly, but you can see on the actual device there's some weaker type shocks coming off, expansions. And there's a turbulent wake and, of course, expansion waves. We'll talk about expansion waves and shocks a lot in this class, so um, we'll get there. Now you'll see in these regions, behind that shock and in front of it, and even through these expansions, all the flow is isentropic. And so if we can create tools to go along particular streamlines in the flow from, say, points 1 to 2, then we can calculate the flow field properties everywhere if we know, of course, positions and strengths of shocks. So this is the tools we'll develop in this class. At least this is for the external aerodynamic problem. We'll talk about internal aerodynamic problems also in this class when we talk about, for example, wind tunnels 
Here's an internal aerodynamics example. In this case, we have a solid structure and our reference frame is attached to it. And the flow is basically near Mach zero or very low velocity out here. We might call this a plenum. And it might be very high pressure. And down here on the right, we have very low pressure. So the flow will accelerate through this little duct or nozzle, a converging diverging type nozzle. And it'll accelerate from left to right and might be a supersonic flow or subsonic flow out in here. It's a pressure driven flow. Now if we were knew something about the flow field, we could actually draw streamlines along it and we could approximate the flow from one point on the streamline to another as potentially isentropic flow. Once again, there's turbulent boundary layers attached to the wall and unfortunately we cannot handle the turbulence problem with isentropic theory. We'll also examine this type of nozzle problem in this class with these tools we're developing with isentropic tools. Now let's go back to our previous module and think about the differences between one-dimensional and quasi-one-dimensional flow. One-dimensional flow means that, of course, there's one spatial dimension. It might be x, for instance, or it could just be the direction at any point along a parameterized streamline. A quasi-one-dimensional flow will refer to some one spatial dimension, but maybe it has an associated cross-sectional area. If you recall our previous definitions, we did, did not include a constant area in the formulation. So here's some points and takeaway for things to remember. The constant area assumption is a restriction on the flow. It's an assumption that we made previously. Here we're going to relax it. The area changes absolutely have an effect on the flow. As you can see from perhaps figure 60, where you can imagine there's a cross-sectional area at every X location through the center of this particular nozzle. Including the variation of the area will absolutely be useful for examining rocket nozzles and wind tunnels and even the external bullet problem which I showed, or projectile, or flight vehicle. They will, of course, have the same physical equations that govern the fluid and have the properties of conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. We have to include energy, of course, because we're dealing with compressible flows. And you'll see there's unique things that happen in compressible flows that do not occur if we make the unfortunate assumption of incompressibility. These results we might view as a stream tube. That is one which is a cross-sectional area about a streamline or a streak line that varies with cross-sectional area. So you can imagine in this case we could draw a stream tube by drawing a line down the middle of this particular convergent divergent duct and having associated areas at every axial location. These areas would only be a function of x. Let's look at one more stream tube example, and this is a stream tube with a so-called actuator disk, which might model a wind turbine airflow, an airflow for analysis. So here the flow moves from lower left to upper right, and this black circle represents the so-called axial actuator disk. These are streamlines and they might intersect the outside of the disk, much like the boundary layer example we did for incompressible flow from Dr. Prantle, we might also show multiple streamlines around this that intersect the outside radius of the actuator disk and go downstream. Here in this case, of course, the in-train flow in the turbine is being pushed out in its wake. The purpose of this flow is, of course, to take the kinetic energy with the wind flow and convert it into mechanical energy, which turns, of course, the turbine and a generator to generate electricity. With this particular flow, we might do a simple analysis by defining a single stream tube that starts here at the inlet, and the bounds of the stream tube might be the streamlines. In this case, we could approximate a single axial direction, which is the dash dot line, or the dash, long dash, short dash line, excuse me, with a particular cross-sectional area. So these are the types of problems we can analyze with these types of theories. Of course, there's a huge energy exchange and turbulence in the wake, and so this is also a type of approximation, and we would have to have empirical factors to correct for that. Let's look at a particular diagram to try and analyze these types of flows, that is quasi-one-dimensional stream tubes for isentropic flow.
we really need to understand how the total energy changes in a particular stream tube. And we'll talk about total conditions in following classes and stagnation conditions and what they mean. In this case, we might go from state one to two, and state one to two might be separated from a differential distance, dx, or it could be separated by a very long distance, tens if not hundreds of meters. At the inlet of this particular control volume, which is drawn over a stream tube with particular cross-sectional area, A, we might go from velocity U1, pressure P1, temperature T1, area A1, to velocity U2, pressure P2, temperature T2, and finally area A2. And so we're letting all these thermodynamic variables change as the flow progresses. And of course, our area or stream tube areas are drawn along the streamlines around the stream tube, like I showed in the simple wind turbine analogy. So let's apply our major conservation laws, which are going to be continuity for mass, conservation of mass, conservation of momentum. These uh, make up the Navier-Stokes equations with an accompanying thermodynamic equation for energy. And if we need, we can use a gas law. All the approaches in this class follow this basic approach. Let's start with the conservation of mass written in an integral form from, of course, the Reynolds transport theorem. Here we have negative of the surface integral of rho u dot ds. ds is a differential area element. u is a vector. The underline represents vector. Bold u or u with underline are vectors. This is the dot product, of course. So with the surface integral is balanced, of course, with a change of mass in the stream tube um, as a volume integral. Now, of course, this right-hand side will be zero because we don't have any mass sources or sinks. There's no mass injection or anything. But we could easily redo the formulation and keep that as like a mass source term. So we basically, in this stream tube case, have an inlet and outlet. And we can simply write this as rho one, u one, a one, equals rho two, u two, a two, for this particular case. And notice we've kept the subscripts one and two on a's, unlike we did before. So now in equation 161 for this particular slide set, we have conservation of mass in a simple nonlinear algebraic equation. Let's now apply the conservation of momentum. This is also a surface integral from Reynolds transport theory of rho u, that's a vector, dotted with each surface element times a velocity over the surfaces which consists here. And of course, there's no momentum flux along the top and bottom part of the stream tube in this case. Remember, this is three-dimensional, so it's all sides. It's a circular area. And we do have a mass flux in and out of the tube. We also have a momentum flux, an energy flux. The momentum flux certainly can be different. It's not necessary. It is conserved. And, um, but there's no reason that the momentum flux can't be perhaps higher or lower at the front and the back. Why is that? Well, there could be some additional forces in the tube, which we account for in the control volume. The second term is a volume integral of rho u dt. So this is a momentum source or sink term, essentially, in the flow. And if it's steady, we can, of course, get rid of d dt. We also have rho f, that's a body force term, which we'll neglect for now, but we can always go back and include that if we desire. But of course, air and plasmas are usually relatively little density and, and for the problems here on Earth with the particular gas constant, or excuse me, gravity constant. So we can ignore that term. And then there's the pressure forces. These pressure forces are on a single integral for surface, and they certainly can vary. So the pressure P1 can be different than P2. The areas are there. The areas are not changing in the steady stream tube. However, we need to account for those in our analysis. So we'll keep that term. So we're really keeping the first term and the second term. Let's try and write those out. Well, the first term, let's evaluate on the inlet of the stream tube, subscripts one. And we'll have P1A1, which comes from the right-hand side second term, rho 1 u1 squared a1, which comes from the first term, plus an integral change from a1 to a2 of pda. That accounts for the pressure forces as a function of area from 1 to 2 on, of course, the, the uh, circular circumference of the stream tube. And then we balance the right-hand side. 
This would be P2A2, which is the pressure forces acting on phase two at the end of the stream tube. And then once again, the momentum flux term of rho two U2 squared A2, which comes from the first term. I suggest if you don't see these steps that you try out these integrals yourself. We're doing nothing but saying that U is uniform across the surface and replacing these, air, these integrals as just simply the area. For example, this is rho one, u1 squared because there's two u's times a1 and the sign is placed so that the mass flux is into the domain and then the mass flux out of the domain at side 2 is moved to the right hand side. This is also nice so we have all the subscript sub 2 for the outlet condition or state 2 and all the inlet conditions on the left hand side as state 1 or into the so called stream 2. So that's our second equation, equation 163. This is basically an integral equation. Um, in this case, if we let the stream tube area remain constant, then we can el eliminate this term. But we have to keep it for now, because of course, we're letting pressure vary through the stream tube and the areas are changing. The final equation we'll look at for this particular problem besides the gas law is the energy equation. And we're not going to look at the entropy equation, but we can look at the entropy change in the tube um, if it's a calorically perfect gas to check if our solution is correct or not. That is, entropy must increase or be equal through the inequality. So we rewrite our energy equation in this manner in 164. We'll keep a heat transfer term in the volume. We'll keep the pressures with views right? The pressures at each end along the surface. This is a body force term which interacts with F. On the right hand side we have a internal and kinetic energy change within the volume and of course then we have the energy flux term. As you quite imagine once again energy flux is most important. We might consider heat transfer by holding Q which we'll do later in the class when we look at so-called Rayleigh flow and Fano flow as a viscous term. And we'll also keep these pressures because, of course, pressures are changing. So let's see what we do when we assume that the flow is steady, it's adiabatic, and there's no body forces. And, of course, delta S is zero, which doesn't really come into this equation. It's an isentropic equation. So these are assumptions you must note when we derive particular theories. So once again, we'll have a pressure, P1 times U1 times A1. And where does that term come from? Well, it comes, of course, from the second term in this energy formulation, Reynolds transport theory of PUA. That's P1U1A, and you see that same on the right-hand side, P2U2A2. Then let's look at another term of great importance, and that's, of course, the flux terms. So that would be another surface integral of rho E plus U squared over 2 times U times A if it's a constant, of course there's no variation of pressure in U across the steam tube face. I mean that's a fine assumption because they're very very small areas in practice. And that's what we have here as the second term on the left hand side and the second term on the right hand side. You can see this is internal energy, this is a kinetic energy of velocity squared over 2 and we just write that in a nice compact form. And note the subscripts 1 and 2 respectively on the left and right hand sides. Now we've already derived enthalpy and talked about enthalpy from your thermodynamics classes and noted the definition in the previous class. H, the static enthalpy, is the internal energy plus pressure divided by density rho. H is enthalpy. Now we'll take 165 and noting H equals E plus P over rho and our previous equation derived 161 will divide 165 through and we obtain after some algebraic simplification this beautiful and simple energy equation. It is the enthalpy, the static enthalpy at 1 plus u1 squared equals the static enthalpy at 2 plus u2 squared over 2. So this means the static enthalpy plus a kinetic energy at state 1 is equal to the state 2 enthalpy plus of course kinetic energy u2 squared over 2. Now you'll notice something very interesting, that there's a conservation of energy, of course. So if the energy, the energy we're measuring at state one must be equal to the energy at state two. So we might be able to lump these terms, which leads us into another important subject. H1, the static enthalpy at state one, plus the kinetic energy at state one, will be called the so-called stagnation 
or total enthalpy. That's used interchangeably. Stagnation enthalpy or total enthalpy. And we'll always call these values H naught. Since H1 plus U1 squared over two, conservation energy must be equal to H2 over U2 squared over two, we drop the subscript. For example, now we do not have H subscript zero one or O1 or not one or H sum naught two, we just write H sum naught. And I prefer the little o in my writing, so that zero there is actually a typo, but it's minor. So we can say the total or stagnation enthalpy is constant in a stream tote. This is a critical concept, and we'll talk more about stagnation and total conditions later in the class. What important implication does this mean? It means that steady adiabatic flows have lines, streamlines, in the stream tubes of constant enthalpy, stagnation enthalpy. As you can see, it could be that you have high enthalpy and low kinetic energy at state one, and vice versa, low enthalpy and high kinetic energy at state two. And so you can take the en energy enthalpy and convert it to kinetic energy depending on where the streamline is in the flow. There's an exchange of energy. Now, let's look at a differential form of this law. We've already derived three equations, algebraic, which can be used to solve flow along particular stream tubes, which is wonderful. You would have to still close them, of course, by a gas law because it's a compressible flow problem, and we have variables of pressure, temperature, velocities, and densities. Let's now examine this with the idea of a differential area. So we'll, instead of going from state 1 to 2, we'll just let state 1 to 2 be separated by a small distance dx. And I've shown that here in 163, excuse me, six, figure 63, differential element of a stream tube of varying area. So the distance is now dx, and I'll just drop subscripts, as you can see one would do, like I did before. We have static pressure p, area a, velocity u, density rho. As we go some small differential distance dx, we'll go to pressure p plus dp, area plus a small differential area, a velocity plus a small differential velocity, and density plus a small differential density. Now, you can see right away that from our continuity analysis previously done in this class, that rho u a1 equals rho u a at two. If we only go to a small distance and make all the same assumptions, we can just simply say that rho ua equals a constant. It's very much interesting to just do a differentiation of this term. And what do we find? A very interesting equation, which is 169 on the slide deck, of d rho ua is zero. Of course, if we differentiate the left and right hand side, we'll get constant is zero and just the differential of rho ua. So that must be zero and we'll keep that in mind as we proceed. Now, for momentum equation, we've just in continuity, we should apply the momentum for this particular control volume once again in streamwise direction. We'll do that as before, and I've already shown the analysis. We'll then drop second order terms as we jump drop in on the right hand side for state two over dx, p plus dp, a plus da, u plus du, and rho plus d rho. Notice, unlike before, when we were doing speed of sound relations, like in the previous class, we're not substituting in speed of sounds, we're leaving u as du. That's the only real difference. And of course, allowing area, area to vary. We'll then linearize, because we're going a very small distance, and you'll see the differentials are very small, so two differentials, or differentials cubed, will become even smaller terms, relative to just the first order and zeroth order differentials themselves. So we'll drop those. We'll then perform the difference with the continuity equation of the term and multiply by u through the whole equation. You can try this yourself as an exercise and you'll find equation 170. You'll find that dp, the small change in pressure, will go as the negative of the density times the velocity times a small change in du. It's interesting that if you went back to the Navier-Stokes equations, which we already addressed, and set viscosity to zero, 
and went into one dimension, quasi-one-dimensional, and set a distance, dx, you would find the exact same formula after substituting in, of course, the differentials. So this is actually one particular simplification of the Euler equations, which we found from Reynolds' transport theory. It's an interesting way to do it. A more rigorous way would, of course, be start with the Navier-Stokes equations in the first place. So here's our current form of the momentum equation in differential form. Since we brought up the Euler equations, I think it's well worth our time to take a minute and appreciate another historical figure, which you'll see many, many times in this class, and no doubt through your career, because of his great influence in mathematics. He's none other than Leonard Euler. He lived from 1707 to 1783, so not that long in the great scheme of things, and he was, of course, born in Switzerland. So he's Swiss. But indeed, he lived most of his adult life in St. Petersburg, working in, of course, the court of, um, of the Tsar. He's a mathematician, physicist, astronomer, logistician, and engineer. He worked in calculus, graph theory, analytic number theory, mathematics, notation, and many other fields, including fluid dynamics. He's probably the most prolific mathematician of all time, and they're still typesetting his writing and notes and mathematics in volumes and they already have over 80 plus published volumes which is more scientific output than anybody who likely ever lived personally he married katharina gazelle who is an artist and painter from the academy and they had 13 children only five of them that survived um, he was of course a devout christian who believed the Bible to be inspired. He was a deeply, deeply religious person, and there's many interesting stories about him. For example, in this particular painting, which is painted in St. Petersburg, Russia at the time, in the court, he's wearing a interesting clothes, and these are clothes are actually Persian uh, in style. They're Persian robes, and it was in vogue at the time to wear Persian robes when you had your portrait painting. So you can see many other famous and affluent people at the time in that part of the world. Uh, Northwest Russia, who um, were part of the nobility or members of court or had important positions like Euler. Um, it's a beautiful painting. You'll also notice in his right eye is a little bit different than his left, and that's because, of course, he had cataracts in both eyes and both surgeries failed. He then went blind, and he was actually more proficient and productive in mathematics after his failed cataract surgeries. And, of course, this was all done before anesthetics. When he went fully blind, he remarked, and I believe from my recollection, that now I shall have less distractions. He was so prolific that the Marquis de Laplace wrote, read Euler, read Euler. He is the master of us all. Anyway, it's interesting looking up history on him on Wikipedia if you're wondering where all these terminology of Leonard Euler came from. I likely don't do him justice. So let's return to our analysis. We have not looked at, of course, the energy equation. We'll now take the energy equation and make the same control volume analysis and add in quasi one dimensional area and a differential dx. We'll then remove the, the nonlinear terms of differentials because they're very small and you'll arrive at equation 171. I urge you to try this yourself and repeat the analysis that has come before you. We'll then divide by rho ua through the whole equation, which is actually the continuity um, equation once again, and we'll result in none other than dh, which is the differential of enthalpy, plus u times du, which is of course the velocity times its differential, and that'll be equal to zero, which is quite nice. Now it's interesting to see a relation of how the velocity changes with area of the stream tube from, say, one state to the next or between positions dx. So we seek what we call the area-velocity relation. Remember our continuity formulations from a couple pages ago. It was the, the derivative, the differential, excuse me, of rho ua is zero. So we can now write using 172 and 171 this form after some algebraic manipulation. We'll get d rho over rho plus du over u plus dA over A, which will be equal to zero. So what does this equation mean? A small change in density divided by the present density plus a small change in velocity over the present velocity 
plus a small change in the stream tube area over the area, the local area of the stream tube, should be balanced to zero. Beautiful. Now let's try and eliminate the first term, d rho over rho, by using our momentum relation and equations, which we showed on a previous page, which is dp equals negative rho du. Think about how we might do this. We have dp rho u du. How can we rearrange that equation? Well, you can solve, of course, for d rho over rho by using our momentum relation and 173 and combine these equations and now we'll have dp over rho equals dp over rho of d rho over rho which is equal to negative u du. This is an intermediate step. Remember that we made the isentropic assumption so all changes in pressure must result in isentropic changes in density. This is why our speed of sound formulation was so important and if you recall the previous class we had and derived the isentropic relation of pressures and densities with the speed of sound. We call that equation and I've written here for your convenience. It's dp over rho equals dp over d rho isentropic is equal to the speed of sound squared. Remember c is the speed of sound squared. In this case we can write c equals the square root of gamma rt if we so desired. But let's just leave it there for now. Now we can combine equation 175 from the speed of sound relation as dp d rho goes as c squared for isentropic process with our previous equation 174. See dp d rho 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 and dp over rho on the left hand side of 174. So we can now write in 176 c squared of d rho over rho will go as negative u du another intermediate equation. Through some rearrangement, which I've shown in 177, I can write d rho over rho will go as negative u du over c squared, there, equals negative u squared du over u. You see how I squared the u and put a u in the denominator. It's the same equation. And you can see now I've keenly put u squared over c squared, which is of course mach squared. You remember m equals u over c. So now I have negative m squared of du over u equals negative rho, excuse me, equal, equals d rho over rho. Okay, intermediate result. Now I can substitute this into the term for partial or d rho over rho, and I find this beautiful equation, which is the differentials of d rho over rho plus du over u plus da over a, which I previously derived. And 173, so I'm inserting this relation, 177, into this equation, simplifying and rewriting. I can write dA over A equals m squared minus 1 of du over u. I put a box over this equation because it's so important. This is the so-called and famous area velocity relation, or more famously called the Mach number area relation. Let's look at this equation carefully and inter interpret it physically you'll see that we have a small change in a over a is equal to m squared minus 1 of du over u. Now m is only 0 or positive, right? So this varies from 0 to 1 to maybe 30 or 40 in practice until it becomes useless. So it's really bounded from 0 to infinity. Now the right hand side of this equation changes in sign. It could either be negative it could be 0 or it could be positive. If I set m between 0 and say 1, then of course say it will be negative because say 0.5 minus 1 is negative 0.5. Another example is if m equals 1, then 1 squared is 1 minus 1 is 0, so then d over a is 0. Or if I say I have a supersonic Mach number like 2, then I would have 2 squared, which is 4 minus 1 is 3, and it'd be a positive right-hand side. What does this mean? That if the velocity increases by a little bit, and it's a positive sign, that means the area must have increased by a positive amount, or vice versa. Think about these rules for a second, and then we'll interpret them together. Okay then, let's see the implications of the Mach area equation, or velocity area equation. For Mach 0, if we put in zero, 
then A, of course, is a constant. And this corresponds to the incompressible result, which is we're generally not interested in in this class. Now, if Mach number varies between zero, less than or equal to M, the Mach number less than one, which is a subsonic flow, as we previously discussed, we'll have an increase in velocity, that is, we'll have a positive du, which will be associated by a decrease in area. So if we're in a flow and it's subsonic and the area decreases as the flow progresses in the streamwise direction, then the velocity will increase. In fluid mechanics, in subsonic flows, a diffuser, for example, will slow down the flow from your previous courses in aerodynamics or fluid mechanics. Subsonic flows, if they're compressible or incompressible, will slow down as the area increases, which is what a diffuser does in a wind tunnel after its test section if it's a subsonic wind tunnel. For supersonic flows, for supersonic flows, m will be greater than 1. Right? So m is less than 1, and the signs on the left and right hand side of the equation will be positive. Therefore, we can understand that an increase in velocity or area will increase the area or velocity respectively. So increasing area for supersonic flow will increase the velocity. This is very counterintuitive, which you'll see in this class, that by expanding the area as the flow progresses, it accelerates. That's very confusing if you're in a supersonic flow. What does this mean when we're in the transonic condition exactly, the true transonic condition of m equals 1? Then you see in these terms, m equals 1, 1 squared minus 1 is 0, then dA over A is 0. That's a very confusing thing. If dA over A is 0, this corresponds to the so-called minimum or maximum in the area distribution of A as a function of x along the progression of the stream tube. This would imply that the minimum solution is the one corresponding to reality. And it's very unlikely that you have a maximum area, and of course it's unphysical. This is one general area where we find generally an unphysical situation for maximum areas. In stream tubes we often encounter minimum areas, and this is where we find the transonic condition. Interesting. Let's interpret this graphically for, of course, your understanding. Here in figure 64 of this slide deck, I write the variation of velocity in the streamwise direction, that is the direction of the flow, with varying area and dependence on m. So let's look at the subsonic cases which are at the top of the screen in the so-called convergent divergent ducts. This is for m less than 1. Let's look at the upper left case. If we are at a subsonic Mach number here, and the flow direction, the streamwise direction, is in the right direction for each of these cases, actually, and the area is decreasing, that must mean, and be proven through the Mach number area ratio equation, that u is increasing. So this is just like a convergent nozzle. If we're at a subsonic condition here, on the upper right photo, and the area ratio, the area increases in the streamwise direction, that means you must be decreasing. And we see this, of course, from the signs of these equations. Imagine dA is positive, the area is getting bigger, m is less than 1, the right-hand side has a negative sign, and therefore du is negative. Now what if we're in a supersonic flow in the same situation as the upper right? So now m is greater than 1, and we're in the lower left figure, where my cursor is, and you see in this particular case, m is greater than 1, and as the flow progresses in the right direction, the streamwise direction, the area is increasing. This must mean that the velocity increases for the area Mach number relation to hold true. The final case is shown in the lower right. Here, where my cursor is, the inlet of this particular flow, where Mach number is greater than 1 and the area ratio is decreasing, this must mean that u decreases. And this is very counterintuitive, that if I'm basically making the flow, the fluid, go through a smaller and smaller area, that the velocity would actually decrease only if the flow is going supersonically. So you can see if you look at this kitty corner from upper left to lower right and upper right to lower left where geometries correspond to converging and diverging respectively, the opposite happens for subsonic and supersonic flow.
It's easy to remember this. Just think about what intuitively happens in the subsonic case and assume the opposite for the supersonic case. Take a few minutes and memorize this physics. Let's look at some more implication of the physics of the Mach number area relation. It implies that for a gas to expand or accelerate from subsonic Mach number to supersonic Mach number, it must pass through a convergent divergent duct. Remember, if you go from Mach subsonic flow, like 0.5, to say 2, Mach number 2, you must go through the transonic condition. This means at some point n is 1 in the particular variable area stream 2. This minimum area we call the throat, and when the throat is choked in a flow, we call that the transonic condition being met. So a choked throat, that is the minimum area of a flow, where we reach Mach equals 1 is called choking. Now, we always label the minimum area of the throat two ways. One, it could be A sub T for the area of the throat, or A sub star. The star, the superscript star, indicates that, of course, it is a choked flow where M equals 1. Now let's combine the diagrams we've shown on this particular slide of, convert, of decreasing and increasing area ratios, that is converging and diverging ducts, into a single flow problem. The upper flow problem here is for a subsonic flow, and the lower one is for a supersonic flow at the inlets. They're the same geometry. The geometry is outlined by these particular lines. At the inlet of this variable area stream tube, we have a subsonic condition. You know, because m is less than 1 here, that indeed the flow must be accelerating because the tube is decreasing area. And if we reach the minimum area a sub star, or the area of the throat, which is choked, that will be the minimum area of the stream tube where my cursor is moving. And we'll label that m equals 1. Now we have m equals 1, and we widen out the tube. Therefore, the flow must accelerate as it's supersonic now, and m will be greater than 1. This is a fundamental principle in our field. Let's try the opposite case. We have the same geometry. But now we start with a supersonic Mach number, as shown in the lower left. And the, the area ratio, the area, excuse me, is decreasing. So it's a converging tube. That means the velocity must be decreasing. Once again, the flow chokes at m equals 1 at the minimum area, a soup star, or a throat. And then we have m equals 1 at the throat, and we progress farther, we become subsonic. Now, it's very possible for the flow to become supersonic, choke, and become supersonic again, or to be subsonic, choke, and become subsonic again. So there's actually four cases. I'm only showing two of the intuitive cases. The other cases are dictated by the particular pressure gradients in the flow and pressure at the inlet and outlet of the tube and or how I start up the flow itself. So there are multiple solutions for this particular problem given a particular inlet condition. So be aware of that and we'll look at those later in the class. Now we've talked about isentropic theory and relations. I'll show these now uh, briefly where we can relate if we know the Mach number at the inlet out and outlet of a variable area two, and we know the pressures, we can take ratios of these relations and find what we call the isentropic relations, which are related to Mach number. These are illustrated in your equations, and we're not gonna derive these here. We're gonna derive them differently later in the class when we talk about stagnation values. I also do not prefer this method because these equations are a bit sloppy, and I think you'll run into trouble with solving problems. But I wanted to note them here because some people uh, prefer them. What is good about these equations, of course, is they show, in particular, along stream tubes, which are isentropic. The isentropic relations and how pressures, densities, and temperatures at states 2 and 1 change with Mach numbers at 1 and 2. And these apply to all the problems we just looked at. If you know, for example, the Mach number at 1 and 2, you can find the ratios of P2 rho over P1, rho 2 over rho 1, and T2 over T1, which are the ratios of the static thermodynamic values at the outlet and inlet of the stream tubes, respectively. We'll show their derivation later in the class. What might be interesting to you is that we can actually reduce these equations to ones which we found earlier, which are related to, of course, the classical thermodynamic stack, static properties. 
How might we do that? Well, if you notice, the right-hand side of these terms are all the same. It's 1 plus 1 half gamma minus 1 m1 squared divided by 1 plus 1 half gamma minus 1 m2 squared. It's the same. The only difference between these ratios is their powers of gamma over gamma minus 1 and 1 over gamma minus 1. You'll see then we can equate these and the only difference will be the gamma. So equations 180 to 182 here will become 183 in a simplified form. We can write t2 over t1 goes as rho 2 over rho 1 to the gamma minus 1 power which you'll see here as the denominator of 181 goes as gamma minus 1 over gamma which is of course the, the exponential term in 180. We can then take the area continuity equation which we previously developed in this class and rewrite it as 184. Remember that says rho 1 u1 a1 equals rho 2 u2 a2. Rearranging in this form of a1 over a2 goes as rho 2 over rho 1 and u2 over u1 we find this particular equation 184. Look at this particular equation with respect to the previous one on 183. You can see that by knowing the ratio of the Mach numbers then all the ratios of the isentropic flow can be known simply by knowing the ratios of Mach numbers at two particular states. So if we were able to measure or predict or find numerically these two particular Mach numbers, we could find, if we knew the area distribution, all other thermodynamic properties within the flow. That's a powerful tool for stream tubes. So let's look at some brief examples together. And these are very straightforward from famous texts, of course, which I've rewritten for your convenience. I'll let you work through these on your own. Try these examples for yourself in addition to the homework. They're simpler and I think it will help you understand the equations where they come from. Try and re-derive some of the equations we've shown in this class if you can. It will give you a greater understanding. The only way to understand the subject is to do the mathematics and derivations yourself and then try the examples. You'll also understand the physics at a deeper level. From this class, it's very important to understand the physics of the convergent divergent stream tubes, which will be coming later in our class. We also talked about the ideas of isentropic flow. Do you recall what assumptions we made for flow to be isentropic and what we need to do and assume to apply this theory? If you don't, that's very important to understand and please review. We also looked at and studied Reynolds transport theory for the isentropic flow problem, both from a state one to two over a distance of varying cross-sectional area, and of course over a differential element. And then I've showed a number of the simplest examples to get you started in addition to your homework problems. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.